Jim Barker joining us from the CFL on TSN on a football Friday. Hey, Coach, good to have you. Look like you guys were having a blast last night. Just, hey, you're the biggest CFL guy I know. You must have loved that ending last night at BMO. It actually was great. I mean, I to be honest with you, I kind of I agree with Moose and you about if the ball goes out of the end zone on a on a missed field goal, I'd like to see that not count as a single. But because then if you're kicking short and you're a kicker, you got to not only think about making it, but keeping it in the in that in the field. Because I love the idea of the rouge of if they if the ball was to bounce in the end zone, then they have to run it out. I mean, how, how exciting would that have been? If he would have had to kick it shorter, misses it a little to the left, but now Mario alford has got to get out of the end zone with them close enough to cover. And again, I look at the Rouge as a, a field position point, and uh, I, I just I, I didn't I just don't like the feel of the game ending on a a missed field goal that goes into the stands. Like I say, it, that's that would be my own my suggestion is to that it's got to touch the field of play. The league's only been around for 100 years, and they haven't changed True. it yet. <laughs> Do you True. think they will? Do you think they will? Well, I don't want them to. I don't want them to change the rouge. I want to keep the rouge, just to make that small adjustment. I don't think is too much that the ball because they used to do that on kickoffs. In fact, I think they still do. If a kickoff goes all the way out of the end zone without being touched, you don't get a single. You have coached many games in the Canadian Football League and employed many coaches as well. So how do you feel about the job done by Corey Mace last night? There's a lot of heat on him in the Ryder Nation today. Yeah, and it's it's uh, that's a tough job being in Saskatchewan. I thought he had a couple of, you know, that I thought the timeout was unfortunate. Uh, again, I, I think he was worried about getting into delay a game there, uh, but... Uh, which would have they would have lost their second down. Um, again, I, I, some of the things that that he that they decided to do now. Some of it was Mark Mueller when they took the penalty on the on the uh, kickoff return and got put back to the eight. I think I probably would have run the ball, and then I'm I'm in control of the finish of the game more. If we if we break one for eight or nine yards, now we can maybe you know try try moving the ball downfield to get you know, the game-winning field goal. Um, but as soon as you're back on the eight-yard line, you go to throw on first down, you bring the sack into play, which is exactly what happened. And again, on second and 17 from the one-yard line, it doesn't make sense to run the ball, but it really does in that situation because the play would have taken six seconds, would have put it down to 25, and, uh, and then... You run it off 20 seconds, which puts it right around 16 when you punt the ball, which you take another six seconds off, gives the Argos the ball in nine seconds, probably enough for one play and then a field goal uh, attempt. So, And it would have been good field position because of where they were at because of that penalty. So, again, it was, I, you know, I, I think Corey's done a, a, a fantastic job there. I think he's going through a really tough time. Uh, that whole timing situation he'll learn from. I went through the same thing where I, I, may, I thought I could take a knee with 55 seconds and win the game, and it turned out I had to punt the ball. And it was, yep. is, you know, you, you learn, okay, no, it's exactly 48 seconds, and you must stand for four seconds, blah, blah, blah. So you learn from those things. Corey's a good coach. That defense played fantastic. Uh, you know, the three goal line stands are great. Uh, but, again, when you're doing that, your offense is starting from the one. And shoot, in the second half, I think Trevor Harris, they only had 112 yards or something like that. So they just could never get out to get going, it seemed like. From an Argo perspective, as we learned last night, there's a lot of Argo fans watch this show too. How did you feel about Chad Kelly's play? In his return, you know, I thought he looked rusty, especially early. Uh, he was throwing behind people. He was coming out, and um, I thought his throwing on the run wasn't what it normally is when he throws the RPOs. But I thought he settled in, and he did what he does. I mean, that comeback he threw on the sideline to Unger was just a thing of beauty, and and, and that with the game on the line. And uh, again, he did that time and time again. In his last year, when when 
he was, you know, when they went 16 and two, he would just come up with these throws. I think that the the receivers have got to get a little used to him because he drills the ball in the middle like no other quarterback in this league. I mean, he throws the ball, it comes hard, and uh, I think it gets on him very quickly. I think Tavares Daniels had a couple of balls that he will normally catch, and he will later from Chad, that, uh, you know, he was just not expecting to get the ball. And again, Chad's going to, he, ta- he he believes in his arm, and uh, he, uh, you know, so I think he, you know, he had a 325 yards. He, he threw the one interception when he got hit and threw the ball up, and Sales got the pick, and that was his really his only bad play. I thought. I thought he again, but he did look rusty, but got into his own, and he's gonna he's gonna be fine. If so he can deal with all game. the what's that? Yeah. So to tonight's game, to tonight's game, uh-huh. Hamilton at Winnipeg. Uh, I was looking at the game notes. You saw what I was saying to Moose. Ticats haven't scored a point in the first quarter for three games, but they fired the defensive coordinator. I think they're two and eight. Have never made the playoffs. I don't think with that record. Um, what do you think happens tonight in Winnipeg? Well, I think they're in tough. I think the Bombers are the Bombers are fighting for their lives. I mean, they have if they have a chance to get to five wins, which is as much as anybody else in the West Division. So to go from where they started to now being five wins, and then the game on Labor Day is basically for first place. Uh, so. Uh, I think I think Hamilton's in tough, but I think, again, I think the Mark Washington thing, they, they've been giving up 30 points a game. They were last in the league in a lot of defensive categories. And the defense just didn't play with any – they had no they, they had no identity. They, I, I could never get a feel of what they were. Some of that was losing Simone Lawrence. Um, they did, their players are, are kind of new. And um, I think one thing Chris Jones will do is give them an identity – and uh, uh, they'll play with uh, um, the one thing about, I, I think Chris is going to go in with a chip on his shoulder. He wants to show the world, you know, remember, I was as good a defensive coordinator as there was in this league, and now he's doing nothing but that and can focus on that. And he will have every tendency of Zach Caleros looks at his wrist in the huddle, and that's always a pass. And when he doesn't look at his wrist, it's a run. They will know that. Because you know Jones, he's there at four in the morning every day, and he's watching every little thing to get try to get cues from the other team to help his defense. And players players get excited about that. So I expect them to play much better on defense. That will help Bo Levi. Because again, it's hard when you're playing quarterback. Yeah, you know, Matt Matt Dunnigan said last night, you know, because I said you know, when you're having feeling like you have to score every time and to stay in the game, and Matt said, well, that's the object of the game is score every time. But when you feel the pressure that if you don't, your team's not going to win, there's a big difference. If your defense can make a couple stops, if your defensive players are playing with a little bit more fire and enthusiasm and stop people and get a couple two and outs, you can get in a rhythm faster on offense. And, you know, I, I, I just have a feeling Bo Levi – Again, he's going against a defense that's given up one touchdown in three games. And so it's a tall order. They're playing with great confidence. Their secondary is coming, coming around. Uh, but, again, I just expect, I don't know why, but I expect Bo Levi to play really well. And uh, it's going to be a closer game than people think. Uh, are you saying Chris Jones is the greatest defensive coordinator the league's ever seen, or he thinks he's no. the greatest D- D.C. No, the league's I ever never seen. said either one. Of, I never said either one of those. What I said is okay. uh, Chris Jones. Chris, well, Chris Jones believes he's the greatest defensive coordinator. There's no doubt. I mean, that's what makes hey. him good. He believes that, and he's out to show people. Don't forget that my abilities as a defensive coordinator, and now that he's doing just that, his focus will be um, on that defense. And I, I expect to see a, a big improvement there from, from their defense. Sure. I just wanted the clarification. It would bug me all weekend if I didn't ask you. Uh, oh, yeah. there, are, there are viewers' questions, but I just got to ask you this. BC at Ottawa Saturday. I don't know if you're working that game or not, but there is a case to be made that that is the game of the week. BC at Ottawa is the narrowest point spread. Rourke versus Brown. What do you think is going to go down in Ottawa? 
Wow. Uh, again, Ottawa, th- I think this is a big game for Ottawa. I mean, obviously all of them are, but with the way Chad played last night, I think Ottawa needs to win a game like this. And BC desperately needs after, I, I think they've lost four, three or four in a row. And after Nathan Rourke's first outing, he needs to come out and play well. They got Dandridge back now. They're secondary. I think Ottawa's as healthy a team as there is right now. They seem to have everybody in place. I think Bryce Carter is the only starter that's not going to be there on the defensive line. And I don't know who they've replaced him with. But uh, other than that, they're pretty intact. And same thing on offense now with Drew Brown coming back. And what I'm going to find interesting is if he struggles at all, if they are afraid to go to Jeremiah Mazzoli after how how he played last week, and will they do that? And which again is Drew Brown ready to have somebody come in for him? Probably not yet in his career. You don't want to give a guy no confidence. So that's going to be a fascinating to me if they do struggle to, uh, offensively. But the BC defense has been pretty bad the last four or five weeks. They, they can't stop anybody. They've got major injuries. Their linebacking core hasn't been good. They haven't been able to pressure the passer like they have in the past. So, again, I like Ottawa in this game. Uh, I think it's a huge game for both teams. It is the game of the weekend in terms of, of importance for both teams. Uh, last night's game was important for both teams, but – this game is 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 really important for both teams. So uh, it's it's an interesting one. I I just I like I think Ottawa if they can just continue doing what they've been doing and not turn the ball over that they're going to have a great chance to win this game. Doing a great job of getting through the four games this weekend. I will remind everybody, my dear friend Tori Gurley is coming up next hour to talk about NFL preseason say, and maybe say hi to Tori. Tori, well, my guys. <laughs> he's, he's something else, isn't he? Um, oh, yeah, he certainly is. Yeah, he's got a mind of his he's got a mind of his own, but so do I. That's why we do what we do. Uh John and Edmonton would like to know if you think the Elks can win in Montreal on Sunday. You know, I, it, it's interesting. Um Cody Fajardo comes back, and Davis Alexander played very, very well. You have the same kind of situation there of if he struggles at all, is it going to be his leg still not ready and they'll bring Davis in? But, I, you know, I think Edmonton's playing. The, their problem is I just don't know if their uh, secondary is going to be able to handle that receiving core. They get Austin Mack back. They're going to have Austin Mack and Rambo both in, the, in there. Uh, I, I just I think Montreal's a, a pretty powerful team, and playing there is tough. But I think Edmonton's Edmonton's the 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 team in the West that everybody's afraid of. I can promise you that because Trey Ford's not healthy yet. McLeod's going to start again, but people know when he comes back, they're a different team. And so again, I'm going to pick Montreal just because they're nine and one and they're playing at home and. Cody Fajardo's back. That should give them a lift. Um, but this Edmonton team is is they're just they, they've been an enigma. But they've won three in a row, and there's a lot to that. There's a lot to carry them into that ball game. Wonderful job, Coach. If if memory serves, were you wearing BC Lions colors last night? A black suit and an orange tie. Who put your clothes? I was together? wearing I was wearing a, a yeah a navy with an orange tie. I didn't want to wear double blue. I, you know, I just, I didn't, I don't have a green tie because I could have worn a blue suit. I was going to wear a blue tissue with a green tie. But, you know, and I think about those things. I probably shouldn't, but I do. But yeah, no, no, you so have I, wore an or, I wore an orange tie and a dark suit. So it was BC Lion colors, but not on a BC Lion night. Well, <laughs> yeah, kind of Denver Broncos colors in a way. And, and it, <laughs> We only got a couple minutes, but let me just say on an NFL vein of all those young quarterbacks taken in round one this year, I think there were six in the top 12. Who do you think will have the best career? Just a fun question for you. The best long-term career? Yes. The best long-term career I think is going to be Caleb Williams. I think Bo Nix is going to be solid. I think he's going to be, he's in a great situation for him. Uh, 
Caleb is, I think Caleb's going to have a good enough team around him. He just does things, watching him in the preseason, he does things that other quarterbacks can't do except for Mahomes. I mean, he he throws off, um, you know, all those different types of throws that baseball players can make. Uh, he, he does that. And he's got a little bit of the magic that Mahomes has. Now, again, is that going to translate with this this team? That's tough to tell, but I, I would say Caleb Williams first. But I think Bo Nix has a has a real shot early to uh, to, to make a name for himself. I, I love him with uh, Sean Payton. I just think it's a it's a great a great match. And you know, I think Drake May things are going to be a much tougher for him in New England. And uh, who are some of those other quarterbacks? I can't even think of them now. Oh, Michael uh, Penix. Jaden, Jaden, uh, Daniel, the kid in Washington. Uh, was that and Michael Penix? Yep. I mean, uh, he's going to be a, yep. you know, he's going to be a backup to uh, Cousins. But again, I just, I really like the situation Bo Nix is in, and I just love watching Caleb Williams play. I think he's going to be that guy. There you go. That's why he was number one. Coach, thanks. Always fun uh, chatting ball with you. Have a great weekend. Enjoy the games. All right. Thanks, Rod. The CFL on TSN's Jim Barker.